All right, so I'm gonna make some comments on some very important uh, videos that came out a while ago. And these videos had the best evidence about the government being involved in secret societies, the occult, child abuse, and human sacrifice rituals were the videos Dark Secrets Inside the Bohemian Grove by Alex Jones and also Conspiracy of Silence which was a documentary that was uh, directed by a Nick Gray. So I've been looking at videos since about 2006. I combed the whole internet for information and that was the best stuff that I could find on exposing the occult. That's the best that I could find with proof that the establishment are complete nuts that are involved in all sorts of criminal activities. So I'm not one to get up and say uh, I want to debunk the Conspiracy of Silence documentary because that is the only thing that has any uh, press coverage that has a documentary. That's the only thing they're willing to admit. So you have to be a fool just to say I'm going to go after the whole thing and debunk the whole thing. Again, look at it this way. This is what the government is willing to admit. And this is the team they've assembled to expose themselves. So from the government, that's the best that you are going to get. And the only way that you are going to expose them better is if you, the citizen, decide to do it themselves. So once again, you just say, this is what they're willing to admit. But keep in mind, these people are not really on your side who are exposing this. Once again, it's called Conspiracy of Silence. And it came out in 1993, and they say it's directed by a Nick Gray. The quote is from 1979. Kids from Boys Town were sent to work at Larry King's companies. And that was how Larry King met them and started to invite them to uh, parties. And then they ended up getting abused. They offered them alcohol and drugs and then they were abusing them. And there was also a newspaper article that says, Call Boys Take a Midnight Tour in White House. And there were a couple of news reports coming out concerning pedophilia and child abuse. And all these high-ranking members of the establishment, whether they be in the media, corporations, the FBI, or politicians, were all homosexual pedophiles. So a lot of this information was coming out. And so they're doing the same thing, which is they come up with stories that they control. When they want to expose themselves and control a situation, They'll find people like Alex Jones and Senator John DeCamp to do it. To eclipse any real people that were pressing charges or coming forward or talking to the newspapers. They want to eclipse the real people who were legitimately fighting these sinister and corrupt forces. They want to eclipse them and get their agents like John DeCamp and Alex Jones involved. So they could do a good job screwing it all up. So let's go right to John DeCamp with this Conspiracy of Silence documentary. Now if you look at this Wikipedia page, that tells you what a good job Senator John DeCamp did on this investigation. If anybody of the general public does a search for the Franklin Credit Union child abuse ring, they'll get this Wikipedia page. And it says a carefully crafted hoax where some children, some unnamed children were saying that all these high level politicians and members of the establishment were involved with human sacrifice, Satanism, and drug running. And members of a grand jury could find no proof of these allegations. So it sounds a little bit bizarre, like a wild conspiracy theory with no proof. So that's what a good job Senator John DeCamp did when he is put in control of a situation of exposing or going after the people that are abusing and killing children. So he was hired as an attorney to defend uh, three 
uh, they're saying children, but they look like they're in their 30s to 40s. And their names are Troy Bonner, Alicia Owens, and Paul Bonassi. And they are featured in the Conspiracy of Silence documentary. And I did a search for that, and it says that it was done in 1993. So I do not know when they started production on this and started videotaping everybody and interviewing everybody on it. I guess about 1991 to 1992, they were filming that documentary for it to be done in 1993. So the quote from Conspiracy of Silence is that from 1979, kids from Boys Town were sent to work at King's Companies. So from 1979 means that's when it started, according to Conspiracy of Silence. So in 1992, Troy Bonner appears to be about 30 to 35 years old. Paul Benassi appears to be about 35 to 40 years old. I am 45 now. And Paul Benassi looks about five years younger than I do now. So I'm guessing he's about 40. And Alicia Owens, she looks 40 to 45 years old in my opinion. In 1992, she looks about my age. So with that being said, if she's 40 years old in 1992, then in 1979, she would have been 27 years old. If Paul was 35 in 1992, in 1979 he would have been 22 years old. And if Troy was 30 in 1992, he would have been about 17 or 18 years old in 1979. So with that being the case, the whole point is that this does not mark them necessarily as children. So it says in the Conspiracy of Silence documentary, around 6 minutes and 35 seconds into it, the quote is from 1979, kids from Boys Town were sent to work at Larry King's companies. And that was how Larry King met them and started to invite them to uh, parties. And then they ended up getting abused. They offered them alcohol and drugs and then they were abusing them. And they said that these three were involved with going to these parties where sexual abuse was taking place. And at one point, Paul says that Larry King had what he called his golden boys, which were kids under the age of 10. And in one of the versions on the internet, I don't know if they edited it out of this version, but they said that Alicia was used as a drug courier. So the whole point I'm trying to make is that these seem like they're perpetrators. These three, Alicia Owens, Paul Benassi, and Troy Bonner, if they're used as drug couriers, my guess is that they were selling drugs to the young kids. And if people were luring kids out of Boys Town and said, I know where a party is where you can get a lot of drugs, my guess is that they'll use people like Alicia Owens, Paul Benassi, and Troy Bonner to do it. That's how the CIA seems to run it. Is that if they want to abduct young kids or influence young kids, they'll send some kids to them that are slightly older than them. Oftentimes they appear younger, they appear immature, but they'll send people in their late 20s to go hang out with young kids that are barely into their teens. They'll send a 17-year-old kid like Troy Bonner to go talk to 10 or 12-year-old kids. And if they ask Troy Bonner how old he is, I'm sure he'll tell, tell those kids he's 12, 13, or 14. And this guy has pot, this guy has coke, this guy has alcohol. And after that's gone, you follow Troy Bonner, or Paul Benassi, or Alicia Owens to the nearby crack house run by the government-sponsored Larry King, and you'll get more drugs. And then you can also get uh, abused by any of their people over there, especially if you want more drugs. So I guess this is how kids can get abducted too. 
So, like I said before, when I was just a researcher, this was the best I could find. When I found the documentaries, like Conspiracy of Silence, I believed that John DeCamp was a real activist. I thought all these people mentioned, like Troy Bonner, Alicia Owens, Paul Benassi, John DeCamp, all the people interviewed in this documentary were all good people trying to do something right. But the truth is that they are all insiders who are involved in this sort of activity. And they are paid to come up with some of this stuff to eclipse all the real people who are trying to expose them, stand up to them, or conduct their own investigations. I have been doing this for many years, researching the occult, and then investigating the occult. I've been doing this for about 10 or 15 years now, and I don't think I have a single real person subscribed to me. They classify my channel, they blacklist my channel on YouTube, and nobody, no real citizen, has access to my YouTube channel. And I just have these type of people as subscribers and acting like they're activists or acting like they're interested in this information. But they are not. So I'm sure the same thing has happened to everybody who is honestly trying to expose pedophilia, child abuse, child abduction. Everybody who is trying to come forward and press charges against the perpetrators or tell the media what they knew. You will never hear their real names. And instead, you'll get people like Alicia Owens and Paul Benassi, who were the ones helping Larry King abduct the children. So in the Conspiracy of Silence documentary, you even have uh, them saying that uh, John DeCamp's star witness, who is Troy Bonner, is a drug addict. And when it comes to the day of the court hearing, he doesn't show up. And then they have a tape recording of Troy Bonner yelling at Alicia Owens, telling her to shut up and telling her that he does not want to come forward. So these are the type of people that John DeCamp is going to get behind and defend and represent in court. People like Troy Bonner will not even show up in court. And guys like Paul Benassi, who DeCamp states he met while Paul Benassi was in jail, for sexually molesting his cousin. And in an interview with Alex Jones, Senator John DeCamp states that Paul Benassi wrote him a letter saying that this child abuse and all these weird allegations against the establishment were true and he had proof. And DeCamp said, oh well, I just decided to give it a shot and go over there just because I was interested. So he went and visited Paul Benassi in jail. And Paul Benassi was there in jail for sexually molesting his cousin, his little cousin. But King used Boys Town not just as a source of young boys for his business. He prostituted them at sex and drug orgies. Paul Benassi was a victim of King's abuse. He was also sent by King to lure Boys Town youngsters off campus. Can you suggest drive around go toward that home as we used to do some of the uh, scavenger hunts of picking up some of the kids? You know, just kind of win their confidence, become friends with them for a while. Start inviting them to the parties. The kids were 10 years old or older. Can you suggest drive around go toward that home as we used to do some of the uh, scavenger hunts of picking up some of the kids? You know, just kind of with their confidence, become friends with them for a while. Start inviting them to the parties. The kids were 10 years old or older. Uh, they have changed the Conspiracy of Silence video a little bit. The one that I watched around 2006-2007 did not have video of Alicia Owens in it. 
It didn't have video of her. It had a uh, video of her voice. It's a recorded phone call of Alicia Owens on the phone with Troy Bonner. And they're having an argument, and then Troy starts to yell at her to shut up. And I remember thinking, wow, she has a real nice voice. I wonder what she looks like. And the only thing they said about her in the version that I saw in 2006 or 2007 is that she had done more time in solitary confinement than any other female in the history of that state, in the history of Nebraska. So they uh, led the viewer to believe that she's somewhere locked up in prison while Troy Bonner is free and Paul Benassi are out free. And that is who John DeCamp is choosing to work with, Troy Bonner and Paul Benassi. Well, women like Alicia Owens are locked up somewhere and nobody can get to them. So it's pretty unusual that I would document that. I wrote that in a document that I began to distrust the camp after reviewing the Conspiracy of Silence documentary. I thought it was great in 2006 and 2007. And then around 2014, I started thinking about it again. And I said, you know what? Alicia Owen sounds like she's the one that wants to testify and fight this thing. Why on earth wouldn't DeCamp go and represent her? Why would he choose to work with a drug addict who can't even make it to court? No wonder the whole thing turned into a mess and nothing really good came out of it. So I documented my thoughts on the matter. And now in 2020, they've re-edited Conspiracy of Silence to include Alicia Owens. And now it's the dream team of John DeCamp, attorney John DeCamp, representing Alicia Owens, Troy Bonner, and Paul Benassi. And of course, they give no details about the case or what happened. And it's still and it's left kind of up in the air at the closing of the documentary. Who knows where this will lead in 1993? Well, I'll tell you where it's going to lead in 2020. They got a Wikipedia page that says it's a well-crafted hoax and a grand jury could find no evidence to believe any of the testimonies of any of the children who came forward. So uh, when I first saw Conspiracy of Silence, I said, wow, this is some of the best proof on the criminal actions of the establishment involved in the occult, child abuse, and human sacrifice. But if you carefully look at that documentary, you'll find that it's just them exposing themselves to eclipse all the real people who are standing up. They don't ever want you to know the names and the actions of those who really stood up to fight these people. That is why these communist governments want to take over all business, all media, the whole internet. Because that way they have complete control of all information and all of society. And it makes it very difficult for you to find other real people out there. So the uh, next guy that I want to talk about is Rusty Nelson. Everything that this guy says does not make sense. In one of his interviews, it is edited to the point that it is choppy. And all the key details have been removed. So the story does not make any sense. And what he says is that he is a photographer. And he was looking for work at a bar. And that was where he met Larry King. I don't know if Larry King owned the bar. Or if Rusty Nelson just met Larry King there. And the next thing Rusty Nelson knew, he was on a jet flying all over the country and his job was to be a photographer for Larry King. The explanation in Conspiracy of Silence is that Larry King was basically employed by the Republican Party to throw little parties at different properties that he owned or leased. One that was in Washington DC, one that was in Omaha, Nebraska, and he would have regular parties during the day where people would bring their families and their kids. And Rusty Nelson was employed by King to be a photographer 
and to take pictures of these parties. It sounds like a fantasy world. I'm employed by a guy who's employed by the Republican Party to throw parties. It sounds like a line of BS. And that is what you're going to find in all these people's testimonies throughout the Conspiracy of Silence documentary. Every single person in this documentary has a testimony that is full of holes. It is missing details and it doesn't make any sense. So Rusty Nelson then tells you that he thought Larry King was a legitimate business guy. He thought everything that he was doing for Larry King was on the up and up. And what he did not know about Larry King was that Larry King threw a bunch of parties after parties. So after the regular people took their wives and kids and went home, Larry King would then have an after party where there was drugs and child prostitutes. And I think a quote from Rusty Nelson is those were the parties where dreams and nightmares took place. And then Rusty Nelson will go on to describe all the illegal activities of Larry King. And he says that Larry King would charge millions of dollars on his American Express card as he flew all over the country involved in human trafficking, involved in child prostitution. And Rusty Nelson even knew that Larry King would go to a farm and have satanic rituals at that farm. So when interviewed, Rusty Nelson then knows all the details about all Larry King's crimes and all this stuff that Larry King is involved in. He knows all of that, yet he says he never took part in any of that. So Rusty Nelson says, had he known what King was involved in, he never would have taken a job with King. So Rusty Nelson knows a lot of details about Larry King concerning these human trafficking crimes. So if Rusty Nelson was employed as a regular photographer for a guy that he thought was a legal, law-abiding uh, business guy, at what point did Rusty Nelson begin to learn about all the criminal dealings of Larry King? At what point? So you can't say that you're employed by a guy to be a photographer and you thought that he was a law-abiding citizen and everything was on the up and up. However, let me tell you about everything that I know, the ins and outs of what Larry King does on a daily basis, taking part in human trafficking, taking part in child abuse, taking part in MK Ultra, which is mind control, taking part in snuff films and snuff film production, and Rusty Nelson even knew that Larry King would go to a farm and have satanic rituals at that farm. So I want to play an audio section of Rusty Nelson talking. And as he is explaining this, in my opinion, he sounds like a pervert. So Rusty Nelson was another character that was involved in this. So I believe that Rusty Nelson was one of the people working with Larry King working with the pedophile cult, taking part in human trafficking, taking part in child abuse, taking part in snuff films and snuff film production. And since he is involved in all of this, this is exactly the type of guy that the Freemasons and the government and in the media will elect to claim to expose this type of thing. So if you have a gang of pedophiles that have taken over the government, and there are rumors being circulated in an area and the rumors are being spread because real people are talking about it. The press may cover a little bit. They may feel pressured to cover a little bit if some real people press charges on behalf of their children. The press may feel pressured to put out a few stories on this subject that is otherwise hidden but I'm going to guess that some real people were trying to expose some of this. And so the government, the gang of pedophiles that control the government, they elected men like John DeCamp and Rusty Nelson and Craig Spence to expose this because they knew 
that those men could be controlled. So they'll admit a little of what they are doing, but they'll present it in a way that suggests that they are not credible witnesses. Their stories will not make sense. A bunch of details will be left out. And when it comes down to it, they'll do an interview. They'll do a documentary. And then they're done. They did their part. They played their role. And now they're finished with it. They're not going to have any additional information. They're not going to try to clear up any questions people might have. They're not going to tell you about any new information they came up with. They're going to play their little role, make their documentary or two, make their video interview or two, and then that's all you're going to hear from these people. Throughout all the interviews where John DeCamp is interviewed, he sounds like he regrets all of this. That's the wrong attitude to have. If you carefully look at what John DeCamp is saying, there is nobody who is softer on pedophilia and these rumors than John DeCamp. He just couldn't believe it when he first heard it. He just had no idea that anybody could be cruel to children. And he felt pressured to get involved and represent young men like Paul Benashi, who looks like this. Then John DeCamp, who is good buddies with an old CIA director named Colby, William Colby. So as John DeCamp is sitting around with the old CIA, the old boys, the old good boys in the CIA, one of them recommends that John DeCamp write a book about Satanism, pedophilia, and murder in the U.S. government. And when John DeCamp gives interviews about this, he still sounds like he has regrets about doing this. There was nobody more hesitant and regretful than John DeCamp on having to talk about all his old buddies in the U.S. government that are involved with Satanism and pedophilia. And frankly, he can't believe it himself sometimes. So I want to play a few short video clips of John DeCamp discussing being at the same Republican parties, Republican conventions, where Larry King was some sort of director, where Larry King was some sort of host or spokesperson at these parties. And oh, they were great parties. Look at John DeCamp in this video clip telling you what a great party Larry King and the Republicans can throw. Not the Larry King TV day, but the Larry King that was a black man in Nebraska, very prominent in the Republican Party. In fact, officially, he was called the fastest rising black star in the Republican Party, and he was the one that opened both the 84 and 88 public and national conventions, sang the national anthem, all that. Could you please? And the biggest parties at the Republican conventions they've ever had. I know I was there. I was a delegate to the uh, Republican National Convention. The one that was at, uh, what was that ranch in Dallas? South Fork. South Fork. Yeah, yeah, that's where his party was, South Fork Ranch. If you remember that TV drama in Dallas, that's where our party was. It was a pink party. 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 He had more. Reagan. Yeah. Draped all over him all night, wandering around like some kind of a huge blanket. You know, Maureen Reagan, the president's daughter back then. Well, she still is, I guess. <laughs> so look at the expression on his face. So just what type of parties were the Republicans throwing to get that sort of response from John DeCamp? He kind of looks a little evil. So what, they had a bar there? They had a DJ? They have a couple kegs? Did some girls get drunk, have a wet t-shirt contest? So those were some parties that Larry King threw, according to John DeCamp. So you can see that that is what he's emotionally connected to throughout this whole thing. He is emotionally connected to the CIA when he tells stories about old directors of the CIA that he's friends with. 
parties that he went to that were thrown or hosted by Larry King, that is what he's emotionally attached to. But when it comes down to exposing this, he is just full of regret and full of apprehension. You can see that in him. So if that is their most valuable player, then that should explain why this gang of Freemason pedophiles would want to camp in charge of exposing them. That is how it all works. So I get the feeling after listening to John DeCamp being interviewed with Alex Jones is that after he's done discussing a few details about this case, he can't wait to quickly finish up and then do his best to forget all about this situation. Oh well, that's it. I can't believe it myself. And he's going to chalk it up as just another case that he worked on. So John DeCamp, when he was uh, in court discussing how the Roman Catholic Church was involved in pedophilia, these priests that run Boys Town were somehow involved in this human trafficking and pedophilia going on in the community around Omaha, Nebraska. He states he decides to go to Rome, Italy and meet with one of the cardinals there. He decides to have a meeting at the office of the Pope and they sent forward a cardinal and that cardinal was Joseph Ratzinger who went on to be the Pope some years later. So I don't know about any of you, but the last thing that I want to do right now is go to Rome and act as an audience in the Pope's office. That's called a conflict of interest. That is unprofessional. So John DeCamp ended up saying that he went all the way to Italy for Joseph Ratzinger to say, yeah, they heard all about the abuse in the Catholic Church and rest assured, they're on it. They're going to take care of it. So here's John DeCamp. He likes to attend parties hosted by Larry King. And when he speaks of Larry King, he seems to speak of Larry King as if Larry King is still in high regard for DeCamp. It does not sound like John DeCamp is any way disgusted on hearing what Larry King was involved in. So John DeCamp was prosecuting Larry King. Supposedly John DeCamp got Larry King thrown in jail. And then when he's interviewed, he speaks about Larry King. Like Larry King is a great guy. 
He was involved in the same circles as Larry King, I guess when John DeCamp was a senator. So he's friends with all these guys. He went to the same parties as Larry King. He's friends with the CIA director. And when he's exposing the Catholic priest's role in all of this, John DeCamp thinks it's a great time to get on a plane, fly to Italy, and then go bow down before the Pope. So this is your most valuable player against the government pedophiles. So I think John DeCamp is a pedophile himself. I think that he is one of the worst guys that they have. I think that he is right up there with Larry King. They're all doing the same thing as Larry King. And they expose themselves in a form of damage control. The government all elected the John DeCamp dream team to step up and say, yeah, we got this handled. Just the same as the Pope saying, yeah, we're handling this on our side in Rome. In the U.S. government, they're saying, yeah, we're handling this through John DeCamp. So all you people who are up in arms about what you are hearing or of what you have seen happen when crimes like pedophilia and ritual murder becomes exposed, when everybody's ready to do something, the government says, yeah, we're with you people. And we got all the best pedophiles over here to act like they're on your team. And you get John DeCamp, who is one of the head pedophiles. So in another video that was recorded by an organization called Truth Fire, John DeCamp says that he was part of the Phoenix program in the U.S. military, in the army, during the Vietnam War. But even on Wikipedia, they will tell you the Phoenix program was about torturing, raping, and murdering people who had become targets in Vietnam. They were trying to speak out about government oppression. They say those are political targets. And they'll rape, torture, and then kill these targets through the Phoenix program. So that is what John DeCamp was part of. The Phoenix program. There was once something that you may remember called the Vietnam War, and silly little folk like me ended up there. I was a captain, infantry captain over in Vietnam, and uh, I was assigned directly to Bill Colby for, he was officially deputy ambassador there, but he was technically head of the CIA over there. He created something called the Phoenix Program, and I was assigned to help him develop and implement that. And. Uh, And John DeCamp was a captain. He went on to be a captain. So that is what John DeCamp was involved in. Interrogating, torturing, and murdering people through the Phoenix program. He also admits in the Truth Fire interview that at one point in his life, he was studying to be a Catholic priest. Um, what, how did you become involved with the with exposing the uh, Catholic diocese, uh, the corruption with, with, because... Well, this is a strange story, because, uh, believe it or not, believe it or not, when I was a young boy, I lived in a monastery studying to be a Catholic priest. I don't think you knew that. No, I didn't know that. It's true. Okay. It's interesting, you know, though, almost all the American seminaries now, I think all, virtually all have the ones that take the children that are about 14 like I was and so on <coughs> to be priests they've all pretty well disappeared did you know that now When you look up his career as a senator, I am not able to find too much on DeCamp. He has a Wikipedia page that is three paragraphs long. And he has an obituary. He recently died in 2017. 
So if any of you are able to find some information on John DeCamp after the year 2021, I would say that probably it came out of the rear end of the CIA. Because in 2021, in May of 2021, there is absolutely nothing written on John DeCamp as a senator. There is just no history whatsoever about Senator John DeCamp. It almost seems at times that he was a fictitious character that was invented just to act in the Conspiracy of Silence documentary. It seems at times that he was invented to act as the opposition to the satanic and pedophile crimes happening in the Nebraska area. They wanted to create a guy who seemed credible. And of course he had to be a lawyer because he was going to take on the satanic pedophiles in court. So that might have satisfied all the people that were trying to do what they could to fight this thing in Nebraska and to try their best to expose this in any way they could. It's time for all of you to relax. We got big bad senator and lawyer John DeCamp handling it now. So that is what they do. They take over as leadership. They take over any movement by pretending to be the authority or the leaders of that movement. It's a psychological trick that people think we finally convinced the government to do something about it. We won. That is what they always count on real people doing. You have to wake up to that psychological tactic. It is BS. It is bull crap. So once again, all the details are unclear. Almost by design. By the camp. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense what they are saying about Boys Town, which is an orphanage. So right near Omaha was an orphanage called Boys Town and it is run by Roman Catholic priests. And the quote from the documentary is that Boys Town had quite a few accounts at Franklin Credit Union that were handled exclusively by the book keeping department. So these were special accounts for some reason. So not only did Boys Town want to invest their money, want to deposit their money into the Franklin Credit Union, but they also claimed to send children to work at, quote, Larry King's companies. So what are these companies? What are Larry King's companies? He's a general manager at the Franklin Credit Union. What are these Larry King's companies? where these orphans were sent to work at? Were these other customers at the Franklin Credit Union? If so, what does that have to do with Boys Town? Why does this bank play the center point of handling children? Boys Town sends children to Franklin Credit Union and then the manager at Franklin Credit Union then sends them to different companies that are called Larry King's companies. So what are these companies? The quote from this individual who is not named in the documentary is that quote, every month or two, they always seem to incorporate one person from Boys Town. Mr. King was a very charismatic Person. When he came to the credit union, he was brought in because the credit union was actually failing. He did everything to build the credit union. Larry King developed close commercial ties to Boys Town, and Boys Town youngsters were sent to work for his companies. Boys Town had quite a few accounts at Franklin Credit Union. Those were considered very 
valuable accounts. They were handled exclusively by the bookkeeping department. But on the average of once a month or once every two months, we always seem to incorporate a person from Boys Town. But King used Boys Town not just as a source of young boys for his business. He prostituted them at sex and drug orgies. So then the documentary states that Larry King used these kids not only for his business, but to also prostitute at sex and drug orgies. Then in 1986, Boys Town staff reported Larry King's abuse to the chief executive at Boys Town. So the chief executive's name was Father Val Peter. And at that point, these witnesses refused to talk to Father Val Peter. So the first question is, what are these staff at Boys Town? And why would these kids, these orphans at Boys Town, go speak to a staff member about abuse? And then when the staff member says, let's go talk to the principal, let's go talk to the chief executive, they refuse to do that. So it's like kids complain to the teacher. The teacher says, okay, let's go talk to the principal. And the kids said, no, we don't want to do that. So it doesn't sound right to me. If the kids did not want to talk about this, they probably wouldn't talk to anyone. That was in 1986. Then in 1988, it said a routine review brought up allegations that Larry King was abusing children. So this was brought to the attention of Nebraska's State Foster Care Review Board. So this is the department in Nebraska that is in charge of foster care. Now foster care is when they take orphans or kids that have been taken out of their houses. They've been taken away from their parents and they are put into foster care. They were put into foster homes. So in 1988, I'm going to guess that some kids in foster care, they were away from Boys Town. They were away from the priests. And they spoke to the foster parents about abuse in the community. And those parents, of course, went to the review board, the foster care review board. So a lady named Carol Stitt was the executive of the Foster Care Review Board. And she said that Larry King's name was mentioned consistently in these reports of abuse, of child sexual abuse. So the Foster Care Review Board then prepared a huge stack of paperwork that they handed over to the authorities. So I'm going to guess that these authorities were the Omaha Police Department. And Carol Stitt says that after giving that information to the police, that nothing happened. So in the documentary, the senior officer at the Omaha Police Department states that there was not enough evidence against Larry King. Otherwise, he would have been prosecuted. So the children had mentioned the names of prominent people who were involved in these pedophile crimes. So these were big names in politics and the media and even the police. So nothing happened. When you had foster parents complain to the Foster Care Review Board and the Foster Care Review Board went to the Omaha Police Department and nothing was done. Then, in 1988, in the same exact year, Larry King's activities finally attracted the attention of the Internal Revenue Service and the FBI raided the Franklin Credit Union and it was shut down. So Larry King was arrested for stealing $40 million. They say that the FBI interviewed victims of Larry King concerning sex crimes, but no action was taken. So what does that tell people? 
because they're leaving a whole chunk of the story missing from the Conspiracy of Silence documentary. Could any of you figure out what is missing there? And that is quite simply that when these parents started coming forward and complaining to the government in that same year, they shut down the Franklin Credit Union. That was where all the money concerning these human trafficking crimes was being sent to. That was who was making all the money. That was who Boys Town had numerous accounts with that were handled exclusively by the bookkeeping department, whatever that means. So in 1988, a bunch of kids came forward talking about a network of pedophiles that were selling drugs, that were running drug parties, that were abusing children, that were abducting children. And the Omaha Police Department and the state refused to do anything. And in that same year, they shut down the Franklin Credit Union, where all the money was being channeled through. All the rich pedophiles that were finding their way to Omaha, or who were buying children that were being abducted off the streets of Omaha and being sold to them by men like Larry King, who was involved in human trafficking. He was making a lot of money that was all being laundered, that was all being deposited into the Franklin Credit Union, where Larry King was also the general manager. So when the kids started coming forward, when the foster parents started coming forward, when the parents started coming forward, the government decided to pull the plug on the Franklin Credit Union. So the FBI was involved in this. The federal government was involved in this. The IRS was involved in this. The Omaha police were involved in this. Because these are government crimes. So the next part in the documentary says that a parallel investigation then took place. And that was done by the legislative committee headed by Senator Lauren Schmidt. So do you have any idea how this legislative committee came into existence to start this parallel investigation? Did any of you have any guesses about who or what started that? So once again, the first investigation was done by the Omaha police who did nothing then the FBI shut down the Franklin Credit Union and also looked into these allegations of abuse concerning children. And again, the FBI did not do anything. So I'm going to guess is that these regular people in this community, maybe they were parents whose children went missing when they saw the FBI wasn't going to do anything. When they saw the Omaha Police Department wasn't going to do anything. They decided to write their senator. Isn't that what they tell you? If you have a problem, write your senator. That's what they're there for. So I'm sure a bunch of concerned parents took it upon themselves to write their senator. And that was where the senator, Lauren Schmidt, got involved and formed this legislative committee to do this parallel investigation into these reports of child abduction, the prostitution of children, and human trafficking. And it was Senator Lauren Schmidt who brought in DeCamp. He's the one who brought in John DeCamp for legal counseling. That's what they say in that documentary. They also brought in a private investigator whose name was Kara Dory. And it was this Kara Dory who found Paul Bonacci, Troy Bonner, and Alicia Owens. So that is what those parents got for writing their senator and demanding help 
from the legislative branch of the government. They got a bunch of bullshit witnesses. Some government appointed bullshit witnesses. They got John DeCamp with his total screw up of this case. And they got the Conspiracy of Silence documentary, which was filmed by some people from England. It is just a giant snow job. It's an eclipse of the real people, the real victims, the real testimony, the real story, the real investigators. And you only get more of them, more of the perpetrators, more of the pedophiles. So some of the reports were that Larry King had several different properties right around the area. He also had properties in Washington, D.C. And at these properties in Omaha, he would have parties where underage kids were invited to and they were given drugs in return for prostituting themselves. There were also older kids that were employed by Larry King to go out into the city of Omaha and go on what was called scavenger hunts. Paul Bonacci said that they would go on scavenger hunts for children. They would offer them drugs. They would get them addicted to drugs. And then they would introduce them to Larry King and this network of rich pedophiles that included people all the way up to the White House. I think the kids named people like George Bush and Ronald Reagan and other famous people in the media and sports as being at these parties. So if you could imagine a 13 or 14 or 15 year old kid, he gets in a fight with his parents. He lives with his friends for a while. The other kids are taking drugs. They develop a drug problem. They wind up at a drug dealer's house that turns out to be somebody who is affiliated with Larry King and this ring of pedophiles. And there's parties at that house and at other houses in the area. I think some of those kids recognized some of the people that were there and they were able to get out before getting abducted or killed by these pedophiles who are extremely dangerous people. So some of these kids were smart enough to take a look around, figure out what was happening, and then possibly go back home. But we're not going to hear about any of that because that seems to me to probably be some of the more credible witnesses, regular kids from regular families who love and support them. And these kids would have no reason to make some of this stuff up. If you are a regular kid raised up in a regular home, you might make it to a drug party. But let's say you're a dude and some older guy starts hitting on you and saying, I'll give you drugs or money in exchange for sex. This freaks regular kids out. They don't want anything to do with that. That will gross them out. That will scare them. When those parties go from a good time where everybody's acting real cool to bad, everybody's running out of drugs and money to worse, there's a bunch of sick predators that are at these parties that are molesting some of the young people and children. Some of these regular kids might figure out a way how to get away from that party and go back home. So those will be your more credible witnesses. While other kids who are getting molested from a young age and are conditioned to be homosexuals, they're not going to consider old men paying them for sex or giving them drugs or alcohol in return for sex as something creepy. If they see these old men molesting 10 year old kids at that party, they will probably say to themselves, the same thing happened to me. So that's pretty normal to them. So if you want to know what type of person 
fits that description. You could look at Paul Bonacci, who makes no attempt to hide that he is a homosexual and is used to having sex with older men in return for drugs and money. It seems that that kid is used to that lifestyle and understands that is how he makes his living. They will even use guys like Paul Bonacci to go find kids in Omaha and lure them back to the pedophile house so they could get new victims. So Paul Bonacci is not going to make the most credible witness. Troy Bonner is not going to make the most credible witness. And Alicia Owen is not going to make the most credible witness. But those are the people that are going to be selected to go forward and appear on Conspiracy of Silence documentaries and go to court and get some press coverage and be interviewed on YouTube while all the regular kids, you'll never hear anything about them, what they had to say or their testimony because these pedophiles know how to control a situation and keep it in the realm of a conspiracy theory that will be dismissed by most of the public and that is exactly what has happened.